morning is DeFrangelo versus Lorraine County Printing and Publishing at Al. Both the appellant and the appellees will have 15 minutes to argue. That's one half hour total, uh, obviously. So the um, appellant may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. Uh, if you want to reserve any time for rebuttal, if you let me know when you get started, I'm keeping the clock and kind of can keep you apprised of the passage of time. The court's read the briefs. We're ready to proceed when you are. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. Um, I'm actually quite ill this morning and I was in, in the emergency room yesterday, so I'm going to, uh, and I don't want any sympathy for that, but I'm just going to limit uh, my argument considerably. I would reserve uh, five minutes in rebuttal. Um, this case is unusual because the judge granted uh, three motions to dismiss and one motion for summary judgment at, at the, basically the beginning of the case. And um, he didn't issue any opinions with his judgments. And really, there's nothing for the court, in my opinion, to uh, on which to conduct its de novo review. I, I think that's, uh, that's clear. Um, and it's very difficult for me to argue sort of anything else other than that because of the breadth of the claims and the issues involved. But I will simply say that I think that the lack of an opinion with his judgments uh, mandates that the case be re reversed and remanded so that the, the, the judge can issue a, an opinion for you to then review. Um, but on the basics of, of the, uh, the judgments, the defendants simply weren't entitled to their judgments. Uh, the motions to dismiss all denied the allegations of the complaint, and in fact, um, the judge uh, considered extrinsic evidence, and uh, the judge actually uh, assumed some of the allegations to be false in the complaint, so he actually violated the standard uh, on a motion to dismiss. As far as the motion for summary judgment, um, I get, again, the, the, the defendant, uh, the Chronicle Telegram, simply was not entitled to summary judgment uh, there were procedural problems with its motion, and there were there were simply disputed facts uh, in the record. I filed an affidavit, um, and that was in the record, uh, and there were discrepancies in the defendant's evidence. Uh, they simply weren't entitled uh, to uh, summary judgment. There are a couple of issues that I would just like to touch upon briefly uh, because they are significant First Amendment issues. Um, the defendant, uh, the defendants, uh, various defendants relied on police reports uh, to assert privilege under 20, uh, RC 231704 and 05. And I would just say that uh, that's not sufficient to trigger the protections of those statutes. A, a, a routine police report and behind closed doors comments, oral comments by a police officer, those cannot uh, invite privilege because otherwise um, there just would no there would be no reputational rights because stuff gets into routine police reports all the time and they're just rife with hearsay. Um, that's one important uh, consideration. I don't think the privilege attaches here because they simply don't fall under the statute. Uh, the other, um, there was another issue. Um, uh, forgive me for one second. Um, Uh, the re republication issue. Um, I think this is an issue that comes up often in defamation cases. I, I, know, I was reading the Melania Trump uh, libel lawsuit, and this was raised in that case as well, which is that oftentimes uh, so-called media will republish someone else's defamation, and they'll say that, well, it's actually true, you know, that they raise the truth defense. They say it's actually true because it is true that there are rumors out there to this effect or it is true that we reported what the report said, or it is true that we reported what the police officer said. Um, but in that case, I mean, that, that's just, that's simply, republication is not a truth defense. The case law says that. And again, if you were to allow anyone to claim truth simply by virtue of republication, no one would have any reputational rights left because you can always, you know, say I quote, I'm quoting someone else or I read this. I mean. The truth defense concerns the gist of the republication, and if the gist is false, whether they admit in their publication that they're simply 
repeating what someone else said, that is not sufficient to negate the sting of the gist. Um, I, if you have any questions, um, I would like to simply rely on what I've argued in my brief, and I'll reserve five minutes of the ball. I got a quick question. So in republication, if you were to cite where you got that alleged false information in the first place, would that negate your repeating false information? Well, again, if we're just talking about the truth defense, uh, no, Your Honor. It wouldn't. Uh, if you want to get into privilege, then there's you know, a limited sort of circumstances where you, you have privilege to repeat someone else's falsehood. But it would not, um, Your Honor, particularly because from what I understand in the Ninth District, um, comments to the police are absolutely privileged if they relate to the, the subject matter of the report. And so basically, you, you, no one would have any reputation left because someone could report, you know, I could report that someone did something to me, and then the media look at that routine police report and then republish it. I mean, there, there would be no protection for your reputation because there's no one left to go after. Um, this is the malice issue, simply repeating what someone else has said without knowing whether it's true or false. I mean, that's just, that's, that's the definition of actual malice. And irresponsibility. Absolutely. Um, I, Your Honor, I, I would like to say um, the, the media defendants make much of the First Amendment protection for the press, and I'm a strong supporter of the First Amendment, but there is also a, a constitutional right to, to your reputation, and the Supreme Court of the United States has repeated this in their, in their defamation case law, where um, there is no right to publish fault, you know, false, to publish defamations, that there is no right. And you, you, when you steal a person's reputation, you, I, you know, Shakespeare said this, said this best, but when you steal someone's reputation, you, you steal more than just their, their purse, just their money. You steal everything that you know, they, they, they are, everything that they've done in the world, everything that they will do. You, you've stolen that when you defame them. Thank you, Your Honor. Jim Hobson. I'm here today on behalf of Avon Lake, Sean Bachelman, and Dwayne Street, or otherwise known as the Avon Lake defendants in this matter. I have five minutes, okay. pursuant to the agreement that we have with uh, all counsel, and I think they each have three and a third each after that. So uh, I'll be very brief. Um, and because my argument is so limited, I wanted to highlight a few of the Avon Lake arguments that have broad application to multiple claims that were asserted by the plaintiff. And first and foremost is the individual immunity of Sergeant Bachelman and Chief Streeter for alleged constitutional violations. The applicable standard of law in this area is very well settled. Once a defendant invokes qualified immunity, the plaintiff bears the burden of showing that, one, the defendant's acts violated a constitutional right, and two, that the right at issue was clearly established at the time of the defendant's alleged misconduct. And it's that second element that I want to focus on this morning. Uh, you are allowed to go to the second element first. Uh, if the plaintiff does not come forward with case law that is uh, materially relevant, the facts are substantially similar to the facts in our case, you can go right to that second prong and declare that the plaintiff has failed in his burden to, to the, regardless of whether there was an arguable constitutional violation, that that right was not clearly established. That is because a police officer has a right to know uh, before he can be held accountable that what he's doing any reasonable officer would know that that officer was violating the plaintiff's civil rights. This, this, is, this reaches across all of the different claims that the plaintiff has made with regard to the First Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment, etc. That's why I chose to address it this morning, because it is, it is one fact that the plaintiff has clearly failed to do, regardless of whether it is an opinion by the trial court or not. He's had two opportunities in this case to present case law to both the trial court and now to this court, saying that here are cases where a police officer was, was, it's been held that this conduct is unconstitutional, and therefore Mr. Bachelman and Chief Streeter should have known that they were violating my civil rights. You are permitted to go to that second prong first if you choose to do so. It's our view that there are no, that the complaint does not state any constitutional violations, um, but even if, you, even if it was arguable, you can go right to that second prong if, you, if that's what the court chooses to do. Or you may address the first prong. You know, as it relates to um, Mr. Peter Angelo's argument that the court cannot address this case because uh, there is no opinion of the trial court. Um, 
I understand and accept on behalf of the city that the court is free to do that. The court, obviously, there's case law out there written recently, about, I believe, by this court, that you can send it back. But where Mr. Peter Angelo is incorrect is that it has to go back, that it's an automatic. In fact, the rules of civil procedure say otherwise. Civil Rule 52 specifically states that motions under Rule 12, and for one of our other defendants here, motions under Rule 56, are not required to be accompanied by findings of fact and conclusions of law. It's not necessary. Obviously, sitting in your chair, it would be much more ideal if that were the case. Well, as a matter of fact, on a summary judgment motion and a ruling, you shouldn't be issuing findings of fact. That would violate the standards. Right. And in this case, we have, you know, the facts have been pled at length. And from the city's perspective, even if all of those facts are accepted to be true, there's been no constitutional violation here. And I need to shift gears to the city, so I'll make sure I give them a little bit of my time here, the city itself. The immunity claim of the city, essentially this will be a Monell claim against the city. The plaintiff needs to establish some custom or policy that the city has and then bring that forward. And what we have here, and if you look at the brief, you'll see in the case law identifies it. It's basically a class of one here. Mr. Peter Angelo claims that he is homosexual, that he is gay, and that he has, you know, more than plain allegations that he is being discriminated against because of his sexual orientation. However, if you actually read his complaint, in every count he says they have a custom or policy of discriminating against me, against me, against me. There are no allegations in the complaint that the city is engaging in conduct that is discriminating against the homosexual, the gay community. There are no allegations to that effect. He is essentially making a party of one discrimination case. You are picking on me individually of a custom or policy of doing that. The pleading standards for that are high. The factual proving of that is high. You must have comparators. I'm going to have to defer to my brief here, but you'll see a section in my brief that relates to comparators. No one has engaged in conduct similar to Mr. Peter Angelo and been treated in any different fashion. He cannot just say they're picking on me, they're picking on me. He needs to say there are, he needs to identify that there are people engaging in similar conduct and that he has been singled out. The cases where they find that such a violation has occurred involve police officers repeatedly ticketing one vehicle on the street 25 times. Okay? You need facts. In other words, there's other vehicles parked on the street. None of them got a ticket. You have comparators. When you have a class of one, as Mr. Peter Angelo's complaint alleges, you have to come forward with those comparators and your failure to do so is fatal to your claim. And again, he had the opportunity to put that in his complaint. He had the opportunity to amend his complaint if he chose to do so at any time to do that when it was brought up, and he did not do that. Okay. Thank you. All right. May it please the court, my name is Monica Diaz. I'm here on behalf of Appley Lorain County Printing and Publishing Company, Anna Merriman, Paul Martin, and Andy Young. I have three minutes and 20 seconds, I believe, so I will be exceedingly brief. Mr. Poffson has argued already why it's appropriate for this court to be hearing our arguments in the first place. My clients were granted summary judgment dismissal of Mr. Peter Angelo's claims. The Ohio Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, has been very clear that defamation cases, or cases against the media involving speech, defamation, false light, however you want to cast it, are appropriately determined on summary judgment because of the chilling effect that these types of lawsuits have on the media. What do you think the immediate effect is on a newspaper when somebody sues them? When somebody is taking very public actions, very public behavior, complaining to the police about a public park, what do you think the impact is of that on a newspaper? It is to stop covering that. That is a very chilling effect on the media, and that's why these types of cases are appropriately disposed of in summary judgment. As to the merits of this case, it's a simple case. It was a simple case for the trial court to evaluate. All the trial court had to do was read the two stories. They don't, the two Chronicle Telegram stories, they don't say what Mr. Peter Angelo says they say. They are very benign, innocuous stories about things that happen in the public record. The first, his lawsuit against the city involving the skate park was the first story. The second story involved his complaints to the police about activities at the park and the police chief's comments about that. And the police reports 
uh, recitation of the facts. All of that's in the public record. The police chief is a highly credible, reliable source who speaks for the police department. It is totally reasonable for a reporter to report what the police chief says about a public event that was documented in the public record. But most importantly, if there's one thing you all should, that I would like you all to clue in on in this case, or key in on in this case, is that in the nearly 100 pages of briefing that Mr. Peter Angelo has done, both in this court and the court below, he never once addresses the innocent construction rule, which holds that not a single statement that was published in either story that he challenges is defamatory in the first place. Not a single story, not a single statement in either story harms reputation. Under the innocent construction rule, the court is required to uh, view each statement in the context of the story, and if there is an innocent construction that can be uh, determined from each statement, it is not, as a matter of law, defamatory. Therefore, we're asking the court to affirm the trial court's granting and summary judgment dismissal of the defamation false light claims against the Chronicle Telegram. Otherwise, I'm here to answer any questions you have. Seeing none, thank you. Good morning, may it please the court, my name is Michael Murray and I have the privilege of representing the defendants who are associated with the weekly newspaper known as The Press, which publishes in Lorain County and covers Lorain County issues. Uh, the appellant's entire claim against The Press is based upon a single article published in June of 2014 that was entitled, Complaints, Incidents at Skate Park Escalated. The article simply recounts the dispute over the skate park that was existing and many of the opinions of the chief of police as to what the situation was, how it should be handled, what is going on, and what the proper responses are. It summarizes a handful, four uh, short police reports about the nature of the complaints and incidents that were occurring at the park. When you read the article, and even when you look at paragraph 43 of the plaintiff's complaint, it is easy to see, number one, most, at least many, if not most, of the statements in the article are opinions, primarily by the chief of police, including by others. And opinions, of course, are protected as a matter of law, and that's something that the court determines as a matter of law. None of the statements are libelous or defamatory. I mean, you can read paragraph 43 of the complaint, you can look at the article itself, which was attached to our answer, and none of them accuse Mr. Peter Angelo of a crime. None of them say he did anything wrong. Everything that they claim he did was perfectly within his rights. He had a right to complain. He had a right to explain that he has a Second Amendment right to be armed. That's lawful. Everything that was described about Mr. Peter Angelo in the dispute that was occurring between him and the people at the skate park simply recounted that dispute and did not accuse him of any wrongdoing at all. So it's not libelous, and you can t determine that just by reading the actual article. It doesn't, and it's difficult to find, he doesn't tell us really what the falsehood is. He's got to allege a material falsehood. He simply recounts what the article said and simply alleges that there's, that, that there's false statements, but he doesn't actually identify what is false about any of the statements. And most of them couldn't be false because they're mere opinions. They don't hold him up to public ridicule or scorn. And his own complaint establishes that the information that was conveyed in these articles came from the chief of police of the city, which by itself negates any allegation of either actual malice or even negligence on the part of the, um, the press, something, again, which can be determined and should be determined as a matter of law before the, uh, the media is embroiled in, in depositions and lengthy discovery disputes. The complaint itself also establishes that he's a limited public figure because of its own allegations. He claimed that his own lawsuit against the city, not only to close it as a public nuisance, but he said in his complaint that the city officials were guilty of misfeasance and malfeasance, a matter of public concern that he raised in his own complaint. He claims that he, did, he engaged in a lawful protest at the park on April 12th, 2014. He claims in his complaint that he made formal written complaints to the police department 
about claimed civil rights violations by the police against him, which is injecting himself into the controversy. He claimed in his complaint he followed that up with phone calls to the police chief. He criticized the police on August 6, 2013, he says. He went to City Hall at a public council meeting to discuss issues with his council meeting. Councilman, he asked for permission to spray paint graffiti. All of this is in his complaint. He called the police numerous times to complain. That's in his complaint. He responded to reporters and uh, asked them to let him tell his side of the story and report it. This, is simp this means he clearly injected himself into this public controversy voluntarily and therefore as a, as a matter of law, on the face of his own complaint, he is a limited public figure and was required to uh, demonstrate with convincing clarity not just negligence but actual malice and the allegations in his complaint negate all of that and for those reasons the court was correct and by the way the court did give reasons as to my motion as to why it granted it so there is it's a paragraph but he but the judge uh, explained exactly what it, what the reasoning was for granting the motion in my case of going last, right? Always. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. My name is Rob Chudikoff. I represent uh, the Appleys, Euclid Media Group, Scene Magazine, doing business with Scene Magazine, Chris Keating, Vince Gregor, and Eric Sandy in this case. The scene is a little bit different in the type of publication that the other news media uh, defendants, or Appleys in this case, uh, in the following respects. The scene is known for writing with a point of it's not objectively reporting facts. Its purpose is to report facts and express a viewpoint. A viewpoint which, by definition, is an opinion that is constitutionally protected. Like uh, the, my predecessor in argument, the opinion with respect to the scene magazine did specify the reasons for granting judgment on the pleadings in favor of uh, these appellees. And those reasons are very simple. The allegations in the complaint that relate to the scene article do not rise to the level of disgrace or degradation that is required to be defamatory. That it has to be more than embarrassing, it has to be more than offensive, and it's simply not. Even if it is, it's clear, it's really clear from the appellant's own brief that there are multiple constructions to the accusations, to the accused statements in the scene article. And under the law, if there are multiple constructions, one of which is innocent, the court, the trial court in this case, is required to adopt the innocent construction, and therefore those statements are not actionable defamation. And finally, that's as a hard thing, and I know you don't have much time, but that's a hard concept to grasp on a on judgment on pleadings, because you're supposed to uh, presume the allegations is true in the complaint, and now you're saying that we need to take the defense of multiple constructions, innocent construction. That's correct. So that sounds like a summary judgment. I'm trying to be as quick as I can. Yes, no, I appreciate <laughs> that. Uh, I think that even on the pleadings, you look at the allegations in the complaint, the court has to make an initial decision as a matter of law, and they did in this case, as a matter of law, whether the alleged defamatory statements are susceptible by a reasonable person to more than one meaning. I don't think that requires extrinsic evidence. If on its face, frankly, the appellant's own arguments show, because he has to argue that the statements are something different than what they are on their face. And by definition, that means that they can be construed. We offer an innocent construction, and uh, the court obviously agreed with that. So. And I regretfully need to inform you that you utilized it. That's okay. I appreciate your time, Your Honor. We would obviously request that the court affirm the trial court's ruling. Your Honors, what strikes me about uh, the arguments, the oral arguments of counsel here is that the, the, the breadth of issues and, and facts and allegations that they talk about, none of that, or virtually none of that, is, is in the, the judgments. I mean, I, I think it reaches to a due process uh, sort of violation uh, level where, where there's such an absence of, of discussion of the issues that it's really impossible sort of for the court to conduct its day, 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 day review. 
I would like to address just a couple of quick points, just to show you show how sort of bad the situation, sort of unfair the situation is to me. Uh, the city's council uh, got up and says that even if you accept the allegations and the complaint as true, there's no violation, there's no constitutional violation. Well, one of the allegations was that during my that I conducted a peaceful, law, lawful protest in a park, and that one of the police officers, Officer uh, Lieutenant Bachman, uh, came up to me and without any legal justification put his, his high-powered flashlight uh, it point blank into my eyes like this. He did that twice, uh, injuring my eyes without justica justification. So he's saying that there's no Supreme Court precedent that says that that's clearly unconstitutional or clearly violates my rights. No, I think the, 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 the case law cited by me in my brief uh, below and, and on appeal clearly prohibits that type of uh, police conduct. Um, and then, for example, the, uh, the Scene Magazine's counsel, uh, uh, Mr. Chudikoff, um, whom I had the pleasure of working with previously, um, he said that there's no sort of defamatory conduct uh, content to, to what they, they, they published. Well, one of the things that they published was that I had punched an individual in an effort to harass them. And they're saying that that's just opinion. I punched an individual to harass them, and they're saying that that's just opinion. That's just flat out wrong. Uh, there's something else that uh, Mr. Chudikoff's client published was that I had transparently threatened to shoot someone. He's saying that that's just opinion. That's flat out wrong. Um, so I, I, I would love um, to go through each and every one of the arguments of opposing counsel and refute them, but I just think that just shows that why this case must be remanded so that the, the trial court can look at these issues because I'm really not getting that first look by a single trial judge at these issues. Um, again, I, I, I would just say one more thing and then conclude um, my arguments. On a motion to dismiss, the, the, the allegations are accepted as true. Um, and on a summary judgment, if there's any dispute, if there's any discrepancy, or if there's something that must be sort of weighed by the trier of fact, then it must go, it's inappropriate to grant summary judgment. Uh, thank you very much, Your Honors. Thank you. Thank you all, counsel, for your presentations today. Court will take a matter under advisement. We will issue a written decision, which will be mailed to all sides, as well as posted on Ohio Supreme Court website.